uh, address this collection. Um, so this is a, a, a novel um, collections-based project that I'm working on with the Jurassic Coast Trust at the moment to unite the diaspora of fossil collections that have, that have come from the coastline and really to improve access to them, engagement with them, and address some of the questions uh, concerning long-term security. So the Jurassic Coast, obviously, as you know, has a, a, a really sort of nuanced um, history with, with private fossil collecting uh, and with public fossil collections. So if we look back to, to Mary Anning 200 years ago now, um, it, fossil collecting has been a key sort of societal and cultural element of the coastline. And that's continued and really within the last 10 years, um, perhaps last five years, has exploded. And we're in a bit of a kind of uh, social media revolution, so that's increasing the amount of people that are collecting fossils. Um, and with that comes all sorts of opportunities to look at material that perhaps wasn't collected before, um, look at digital access to fossil collections and ways in which we can uh, use the specimens have, have changed massively if we're able to address some of the um, core concerns around specimen acquisition, etc. So I'll touch on that as we, as we go along. So the paleontology on the Jurassic Coast, um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, the Jurassic Coast was inscribed for a series of core sites that have contributed either historically or contemporary at the time of uh, site inscription, which was 2001, to paleontological science as a whole. So some of these have kind of ring true, so the, the uh, Triassic rocks of East Devon, for example, are one of the inscription sites for Lower Jurassic, um, and then you go on to more kind of um, nuanced ideas, so ammonite zonation throughout the Mesozoic um, is also captured in there. Um, and whilst the importance of the site's paleontology is, is well described in scientific literature, so when we were being inscribed, um, a lot of the sort of references made there uh, were the uh, publication, published um, science, and, and that in itself creates a bias. So there's historically, and, and, and really even now, a lot of research gets done on marine reptiles, really kind of uh, fancy and amazing fossils, whereas relatively little um, work gets done on things like bivalves or the, the kind of the molluscan fossil record, for example. So there are some things in there which we'll uh, break down later in the presentation and try and kind of uh, tease out some answers to. Uh, so the challenges facing paleontology on the World Heritage Site. So um, probably for me, I think one of the, the crucial challenges that we face is more could be done um, to improve access to important fossils, but also the stories that they're told. Um, so we just saw in Richard's presentation this kind of amazing um, history, this amazing narrative associated with the coastline, uh, and I think it's um, a criticism probably shared by um, a lot of people that, that, that we're, we're um, unable to tell that story perhaps in the, in the way that we want, um, physically and, and digitally. Uh, there needs to be a better emphasis on their, their role within the World Heritage Site, but also within World Heritage uh, status in general. So why this place um, is, is deemed important to the, the global community. Um, improved mobilisation of stored specimens. Um, so the Natural History Museum, for example, have tens of thousands of specimens from the Jurassic Coast that often sit um, unseen for, for up to 10 years at a time, say, if, if scientists aren't looking at that material and, and will likely never end up on display. So there are ways in which we can improve access um, with those. Likewise, um, there's a lot of specimens held in uh, private collections, and I'll get onto this in a little bit more detail. Um, I think acquisition, uh, personally, I think acquisition um, is probably the biggest challenge facing paleontology on the coastline at the moment, something that needs addressing um, ideally 20 years ago, but if we, you know, if we start now, there are still some, some really incredible inroads to be made as to, as to how we look at that. And um, long-term security provisions, so where we're going to store these collections, how we're going to um, acquire and uh, safeguard all of these amazing fossils that exist but currently aren't in public collections. So the purpose of the Jurassic Coast Collection, um, at its core function, the Jurassic Coast Collection um, is intended, uh, and it's a long road ahead, to be um, the most complete record of important fossils that have come from the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site. We'll get onto a little bit more about where we place importance, but that looks at um, cultural significance, so perhaps uh, specimens that were found by Mary Anning, um, even historical artifacts like Durio Antiquior, for example. Um, 
but also uh, scientific significance and visual impact. You know, how it attracts tourists to the area, um, how it uh, impacts people in their everyday lives. And yes, as I've already summarised, to, to improve access and the ability of those. So the uh, paleontological features of the coastline, I do have a list a little bit um, later on which goes into those, but that was what the site was inscribed for. There was 11 sites, um, and as I said, the, there, there are uh, a myriad of different geological uh, interests highlighted in that. Um, some you've perhaps never heard of, so there's a, a, a forest marble um, site and a, a near Watton Cliff, uh, and that's got, for example, some, some early mammals in, so that was one of the, um, the sites that we were inscribed for, but yeah, there are more uh, well-known ones, like the Lower Jurassic, et cetera. Um, and when we're assessing this resource, they broadly fall into, into three categories, um, particularly in this phase one of the project where we're uh, looking for sort of some, uh, building some momentum um, into the project. So key scientifically important fossils, those um, that represent or are likely to represent new species. So Rob's come on earlier today and was talking a lot about his collection. Rob's been heavily involved with the, um, with the project as of the scientists that he works with at Bristol University. Um, because a lot of uh, Rob's fossils, the significance lies in the fact they've never been seen and they're new to science. Um, but we can go on and we can assess that slightly differently and we can look at stratigraphic collections, for example, um, how you define ammonite zonation throughout the Mesozoic, but also reference material for ongoing scientific study, etc. And then you get into the more kind of um, uh, blue side thinking ideas around significance. So yeah, fossils with a significant visual or emotional impact, so fossil collecting um, particularly in the memories of a lot of fossil collectors that exist now, has a, a, a communal collection. You know, they've, they've known each other for you know, up, to, up to 50 years. So there's a, a societal impact there, um, which, which really, as a World Heritage Site, we should be assigning significance to. Um, and this, this really boils down to the significance assessment process. It's a tool used by museums to ascertain whether they will include items in their collection. Um, and it looks at uh, geographical collecting area, for example. So for us, that's expanded a little bit to the, to the Jurassic Coast as a whole. But it also looks at whether it will fit in their existing collection, um, the, the, the importance of it. Uh, how does this differ from the fossil collecting codes um, of conduct that exist and the, kind of the recording schemes that exist currently? So West Dorset, for example, is a perfect example since inscription has had or very close to inscription has had uh, a fossil recording scheme and, and this is really a, a key tool of site management whereas the Jurassic Coast collection is, um, is, a, is a much more kind of uh, holistic idea that looks at how we can improve areas um, of underrepresentation. So that really the, the fossil collecting codes are um, a, around the transfer of, transference of ownership. So if you collect fossils responsibly from um, the, the site, uh, that, that legal title gets transferred. So that's one of the main issues. But really the, the recording schemes only deal with scientifically important fossils or fossils that are potentially scientifically important. Um, and they boil down into similar kind of category one, category two specimens, but also they're geographically um, biased. So the West Dorset Fossil Collecting Code, for example, um, deals with a specific uh, geographical region. The National Nature Reserve um, Fossil Collecting Code, which has just come in, deals exclusively with Monmouth Beach, Pinhay Bay, et cetera, that sort of area. So there are some, some limitations there as well. So how does the Jurassic Coast Collection support um, paleontological heritage? So it provides, uh, or it will provide a, an, an evidence base to show people what we have and what we can do with those fossils. Um, Identify and support priority areas of specimen acquisition. So where we have, um, you know, some really amazing private collections, for example, or perhaps individual fossils that would benefit existing public collections. That's the sort of thing we'll be looking at. Um, promotes kind of further investment and support for the creation of new facilities. Expand um, how we how we look after fossil heritage. So it's a question asked um, earlier, and I'll get onto it a little bit later uh, in the presentation. But really, um, it needs to be. As a, as a driving force to address um, what is probably the big question that exists um, and has existed 
since inscriptions were heritage site, is how we collectively store these really important fossil collections, tell the narrative um, of the Jurassic Coast in its completeness, uh, and allow people to engage with it in a way that you can't do um, currently on the coastline. And more generally, uh, to encourage public interest in and recognition of the, the facilities that we already have and the public fossil collections that, that currently exist and have, in some cases, existed um, locally for over 100 years in some of the existing charities. So museums, visitor centres and Jurassic Coast collections. One of the core uh, stakeholders that we obviously work with, and they can boil down roughly into three categories. So we look at um, museums and visitor centres, so public collections locally and nationally, uh, private fossil collections that currently exist, um, and academic uh, institutions. So some uh, universities, like Bristol University, will house fossils. Um, so that you can research them and publish on them, but you're also looking at sort of national bodies like the British Geological Society, etc. Um, and the benefits uh, for this group are, are kind of outlined here, really. Um, and it's all around how uh, we support the infrastructure that already exists and how people connect with existing public fossil collections. So there's a lot of work there um, around the potential for digital access, uh, mobilization of stored specimens, etc., etc. And as I say, there's, there's all sorts of kind of um, nuanced, more sort of uh, charity specific outcomes in there around volunteer training, um, helping uh, improve the narrative around why paleontological heritage is important, um, and all sorts of things like that. And then uh, I, have, so I haven't highlighted uh, the academic sphere in that because often that's a lot more simple, a lot less nuanced. It's all around um, finding really important and really amazing specimens, getting them into public collections and publishing on them. So it fits kind of quite neatly after we uh, sort of address these two main areas of concern, I guess. Um, and yeah, just to, to, to reiterate that really um, fossil collectors uh, are one of the, you know, or, or really the, the driver behind a lot of the significance we have on the Jurassic Coast. Um, with the fossil records, so they're out there most days, you know, in all, all sorts of weather, collecting and recovering these specimens. So um, it's a really easy opportunity and a really kind of important opportunity, I think, to, to demonstrate how fossil collectors um, contribute to site conservation, site management. Um, there are often criticisms from kind of the academic community, for example, um, around the, the allowance of, of private fossil collecting, etc. So for me, the Jurassic Coast Collection, one of the things it will do um, is, is demonstrate why that's a kind of really core aspect of, of, of site management. Um, it will look to promoting the ambitious exhibitions of fossils, uh, encouraging research and all of those kind of um, components that are associated and, and, and actually is, is lacking currently on the coastline or, or is not reaching its full potential certainly. Um, so I thought at this point it's probably worth showing just some nice pictures of fossils just in case I was really, uh, everyone was, was, was switching off with the more kind of process driven stuff. So uh, this, is, <laughs> this is one we registered, uh, this is the cathedral. But funny enough this was actually uh, one of the fossils included um, in the inscription document. And, and, and thought to, to kind of really uh, show everybody the, the, some of the amazing fossils that we have. And um, so this is a, an early Jurassic fish um, from Lyme Regis, that's found by a collection of David Sol. Uh, quite a lot of these were just because um, I had a lot of pictures of David's fossils uh, to hand. Um, uh, so yeah, as I said, these are the, the, the sites that we will be focusing on. I'll go back to some more fossil pictures, I promise. The slides, slides shift just down a couple. Um, but yeah, as I say, there are, there are uh, some on there that you perhaps won't have recognised, some that, some that you will. So the fossil forest, for example, is a really nuanced um, component of the, the paleontological history of the site. It's a static site, um, and, and obviously it's therefore only shown in, in museum collections by perhaps one or two specimens. You've got things um, like the Kimbridge Bay, for example. Steve Etchett is doing a, you know, an amazing job of really uh, demonstrating um, the value of the Kimbridge Clay fossil record locally. Um, likewise with the, uh, the sandstone vertebrates, which Rob um, was very modest, has actually kind of, you know, really redefined our, our contemporary um, significance of the site with some of the work that, that, that he's been doing now. Um, so yeah, as I say, this is uh, uh, a component of um, some of uh, the material that Rob's found. And has worked on with, with Bristol University, so I've been lucky enough to work with, with Rob 
there. Um, Christ's ichthyosaur skulls, that's a pretty deep um, ichthyosaur that exists in a, in a private collection at the moment. This one's really interesting, so it was prepared by um, the late David Coston, who um, was, a, was really a master of this craft, and has actually, you can't really see it kind of in the, in the picture there, but the skull is all um, cleaned out from the inside with acid preparation, and it begins to kind of uh, lean in and, and, and recognise that skilled community that exists around private fossil collecting and the potential um, that it unlocks if we're able to, to create collaborative relationships between private collectors, <coughs> museums, etc. Um, this is a, a collection of fossil insects. Um, so, uh, this again comes from the marine rocks at Lyme Regis. Often, uh, so we would have had archipelagic island systems that existed at areas of topographic high, perhaps amended hills, Cornuvian massive, etc. Um, and you would have had insects, whether they were on uh, detritus sort of um, uh, wood um, that, that had washed out to sea through storm activity, or perhaps they were caught in big gusts of wind. So he has made a habit, instead of going after the big reptiles, so I'm sure he'd like to find one, um, of collecting these insects uh, from, the, from the concretions. And as you can see, the, the preservation associated in there is, is absolutely fantastic. That's a, a, an ancestor of the cricket on the left. Um, you know, and, and, and with this collection, uh, once it's accessioned, once it's available uh, within, a, within a museum, within a public collection, uh, a significant portion of these are likely to represent new species. Um, but also, it, it leans towards that narrative. You know, we could tell a really amazing story about insect evolution here, for example, and, and modern biodiversity crises. So that's a, yeah, that's a, a truly fantastic collection. And, um, uh, a funny kind of happy coincidence, so um, the chap who owns the previous collection has a, a new species of water bug which is deemed really important but it was only uh, an isolated wing so you can imagine as these, these things are falling through the sea they get scattered or perhaps eaten by fish uh, and broken apart. And whilst we were doing the Jurassic Coast collection within the sort of process of registering um, multiple private collections we found this specimen which is actually um, a complete version. So it shows that sort of, or, or hints to that sort of idea of cross-fertilization and the fact that if we were able to um, unite these private collections in one, um, hopefully, you know, in a, in a physical center, uh, the, the, the sort of the science that could happen and the stories that we'd be able to tell would be greater than the kind of the sum of their parts. Really. Um, there we go. And of course, just some, um, some nice animals because everyone likes some animals. Uh, I will just quickly, this is an amazing resource, this was found by um, Jack Ian Smithwick, who is um, seemingly everything he touches uh, seems to turn into an issue all these days. Uh, but yeah, another example of the kind of the um, visual and engagement act, uh, importance of some of these specimens. So if we, if we were able to kind of uh, create a centre of, uh, create a physical exhibition that, that displayed some of these material, um, when we look at what's on display at the moment, which is often uh, Victorian specimens or, or antiquated specimens, the degree of preparation that's evolved in the last, say, 100 years is, is, is really mind-boggling. And there's an opportunity there, really, to, um, to demonstrate that evolution of process, that evolution of craft as well. Um, so the kind of the, the next steps for us, really, or the kind of the, the process that happened, that's happened so far. So the Jurassic Coast collection is about um, two years old. It obviously spans. Uh, it, it basically, I think, I was employed for about three weeks before COVID started. Um, so that really kind of threw everything up into the air, particularly when we're accessing uh, private fossil collections or public fossil collections, etc. But the work that we have done and the sort of the um, steps that we have made, so uh, the Jurassic Coast collection or the sort of the, the need to improve access to important fossils has become a core conservation aspect of the site. Um, we, uh, that resulted in, in the permanent recruitment of my role um, to, to look at bringing this forward and to ensure that it was no longer project based, it was a, an on-running thing. Um, 
We uh, just started uh, to finalise the recruitment of a working group, so that will include um, members from all the different stakeholder communities. Uh, so at the academic researchers, for example, professors at university level, um, local fossil collectors, uh, strategic advice, uh, local museums, national museums, for example, um, in order to, to, to lead on some predetermined outcomes. And one of those uh, predetermined outcomes uh, or, well, rather the, the whole kind of um, development of the Jurassic Coast Collection is around these three uh, components of improving public access uh, to fossils, and that will be um, through a, a myriad of different ways, so exhibitions, uh, a digital platform, digital museum, um, and, and physical, uh, hopefully eventually, um, supporting the management and sustainability of existing uh, collections, and as I said, finally addressing the acquisition and long-term security of privately owned uh, fossil collections. So this is kind of, um, the announcement is a little bit out of date, but um, recently we announced that we would um, uh, tender um, and complete in collaboration with the working group a feasibility study that does finally address um, some of these questions around a new centre uh, dedicated to the World Heritage Site and its fossil record. Um, so that will look at the fossils that we have available, um, the, the scope of the building, where that's best placed, etc, etc, and the story um, that it could tell. So that's really exciting, something which I hope really in the next six months we'll have a, a definitive answer to and can kind of look towards how that's, um, how that's being delivered. Uh, and yet, as I say, the next kind of 12 months for us really is around um, focusing on acquisition, which as I've said earlier, I think is really the, um, the area that's, that needs the most work, needs the most kind of um, effort uh, forward at the moment. Um, a series of exhibitions to celebrate uh, our 20 year anniversary as a World Heritage Site. Um, and all sorts of kind of uh, good stuff aside from that, which is stuff around uh, opportunities for research, um, opportunities to look at the paleontological importance of the World Heritage Site and expand that beyond the 11 uh, inscribed sites that we, that we looked at. So there's, there's all sorts of nuance we can do around that. You know, the Cretaceous, for example, we could look at the chalk or the green sand, um, particularly in line with modern research. And then, yeah, as I say, you know, areas to, to look at improving um, areas of underrepresentation where you've had historical collecting bias, for example, um, and early scoping work for, for this centre uh, dedicated to the World Heritage Site and its exceptional fossil records. So, hopefully, um, yeah, we're at a real precipice now and we can, um, we, we've got a lot of the foundation, a lot of the kind of um, internal understanding to, to, to look at that for the next step, which I think is, is really exciting. And um, yeah, I guess something to, to just kind of leave you with, really, uh, and, and I guess the take home uh, from the whole thing, certainly for myself, is, is uh, how we consider outstanding universal value. And I think that's changed really in the 20 years uh, since its inscription. So how do we consider that um, as communities, as local communities, but also as a global audience. So whether that just lies in the scientific significance of these fossils that have been found and the potential scientific advancements that are made from our local sites, or whether we begin to look at that um, for the contribution that individuals have made, for example. So um, whether you, you, you go back 200 years to Mary Anning or you look more recently at the communities of fossil collectors um, who have gone largely undervalued, uh, we, certainly within the last uh, 50 years, and, and, and how uh, these communities have, have grown from our fossil records. So I think there's a lot of kind of um, understanding to be, to be had around where we, what we call outstanding universal value, which is that measure of world heritage statement. Yeah, that's, uh, that's me.